Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number one, two, one. Uh, today, wow, um, I have a very special guest. I've caught him on his travels to London on his book tour. Um, I am not sure if you've heard of this guy before, but this guy is like the Australian Jamie Oliver. And you know how much of a fan I am of Jamie Oliver. He's an absolute legend. Um, Pete Evans, hello. G'day, mate. <laughs> Sorry if it's a little bit noisy. I mean, I'm actually in a London cab. I've always wanted to be in one, and this is awesome. <laughs> is it a black cab? <laughs> uh, it is, I think, yeah. That's okay. That's that's very British and very London. Fantastic. I love, the... I love it here. It's, what, a, what a wonderful city I've never been here. It's taken me 41 years to get here, and uh, it's. Um, I could actually live here. I love it. Nice. I, I'm, I'm amazed being, you know, obviously a, quite a high-profile individual that you've never made the trip over to what is kind of partly the world's capital in many respects. Uh, for sure. It, it, it's, it's not through a lack of trying. It's just that uh, circumstances haven't, haven't led me here. But um, all things come to those that wait, and uh, here I am. And it's also, it is a really long way. Yeah, it's that too. It's that too. It's a, it, I tend to go for the uh, South Pacific Islands because they're quite close to Australia for my holidays because they're only three hours flight. And uh, that excites me a little bit more to serve some good waves. But, uh, mate, I've been eating some good food in your town over the last couple of days. Yeah, that's the thing with London. You're just spoiled for really, really good cuisine because the city just demands it. The city wants the best of everything and, like, food. It's just, yeah, it's brilliant. So, mate, we need to get into the nuts and bolts of the show. Um, I'm really excited for this because I have been studying your work and I, I love some of your opinion. I love the way you're trying to tackle your work and some of the bigger issues in the world. Um, so first, we need to cover right from the ground up. Um, simply speaking, who is Pete Evans? <laughs> Uh, the fellow on the other end of this Skype call with you. <laughs> but, um, um, I'm a father. I'm a, a soon-to-be husband. Um, I've got two beautiful little girls. Uh, I've been a chef for 25 years, always interested in health and nutrition. Uh, I'm a qualified health coach now. Uh, and I'm someone that is committed to learning the truth and, uh, and spreading the truth and um, helping people on this planet uh, reclaim their health. Um, that's probably about it. <laughs> I'm a student of life and uh, sometimes I, t I take what I've learned and try to repackage it in a, in a simple way and generally it's through food. Nice. Uh, what a humble um, guy. Um, it's always nice to hear. There's no, there's no smoke up Pete Evans bum. Um, uh, so you're very much in the public limelight these days. Your work has taken you to that level. What was the transition like from going to, you know, from just a chef to almost a celebrity, a television chef? How did it happen? What was the story? Well, I think any chef that's listening to this podcast out there will understand that if you're a chef, you can do anything. Uh, and and I'll, I'll put the ego out there for that one because chefs work bloody hard from, mm. the, from the day that they're basically initiated into uh, the kitchen hierarchy system where you, you start at the bottom. Uh, for anybody that, that can work their way through those ranks, um, it comes out a lot tougher. They've, they've got very, very tough skin. And, and, and I, I, I feel that it was the perfect, I guess, training ground or, or area for me to, to toughen up, actually, for, the, for, the, for some of the challenges that we're going to be facing or have faced over the last few years about promoting I guess, a, a healthier way of life, which, which flies in the face of um, big agribusiness, big pharmaceutical, uh, uh, big medicine, you name it. it. This has the ability to potentially change the world. Uh, it definitely has the potential to change uh, people's health. Um, but it's been fantastic. And um, going through the whole chefing uh, I guess hierarchy, and then popping out the other side into uh, into the world of media through TV shows and whatnot has been a, a, a wonderful experience. And I'm still learning. I'm at, I mean, my infancy is as far as how to deal with media and how to get a message out. But um, that excites me as well because I've got so much more to learn. So, I mean, on, how did it happen? Like nuts and bolts. Like, what was the the kind of catalyst from 
going from sort of everyday chef to sort of the celebrity realm or was it, I mean, did you intentionally set out to pursue that path or was it kind of something cool just happened and you ran with it? Yeah, well, I, I was the most reluctant celebrity chef. I mean, a lot of uh, chefs enter the profession these days to become famous. Uh, I couldn't think of anything worse when I first started out. I was, I was running my own restaurant and I, I had a phone call from a TV company and said, well, we like your food. Would you consider auditioning for a TV show that we're hosting, uh, producing? And I said, mm, no. Nah. I said, I couldn't think of anything worse. Um and then a few days later, they called again and said, listen, we really want you to come in. And, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of, uh, not coincidences, but, but uh, when, when, when opportunities come and they, uh, and they come more than once, then usually it's a sign from something that says, maybe you should investigate this a little bit more. I mean, you, everyone experiences this in their life. They're, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? And, and sometimes you say no, and then all of a sudden the opportunity appears again, and you're like, hmm, why is this, why is this happening? So, um, so I investigated that further, and, and uh, looking back on it now after 15 years of being in the media realm doing TV and uh, numerous shows and being in the public eye, I know that uh, it was pulling me along to be able to get to this point in time, if, if, if you want to look at it from a holistic point of view. But at the time, no, I couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> I, was, I was the shyest person in the world. Well, when you think about it now, like you've, you've just mentioned grabbing an opportunity and, you know, things presenting themselves, there's not many people in the media limelight that – are really outspoken in the way that you want them to be, especially with when you when you have the power of being in the media limelight, you are in a position to change things more so purely because you have a voice or more voice than other people. And, you know, some of your work has been, you know, quite outspoken. You've been quite opinionated and direct about stuff. And surely this is this is kind of the reason why you've potentially been gifted with that that greater limelight. Well, for sure. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people out there that uh, are scared that if they say something that they that they believe in, what what potential the backlash will be, either from the media or the press or from their followers if they've got a social media base. And so a lot of people sometimes just toe the line and uh, walk a very, you know, don't create waves. And, mm. and I'm not here to cre or create waves, but I'm definitely not here to... Um, be silenced or, or not engage in an in a intelligent conversation about something that is is so powerful, which is talking about the power of food as medicine. Um, and, I, and I'm happy to talk and stand up and, and discuss this in a in a public forum or you know, um, for for people to start questioning their, their own beliefs and what they've been taught because from what I've witnessed and what I've experienced through um, my own social media and my own um, exploration into this world is that a lot of people can heal themselves and, and uh, reclaim their health through some simple, simple practices, um, especially after they've been through the conventional metals system for 20, 30 years with disastrous results. Um, whereas this is uh, some for most people, it's a, it's a simple process. Nice. You mentioned just then about food being my medicine, which is um, you know a very famous quote and something that I think a lot of healthcare practitioners need to kind of believe and follow in. And I suppose that kind of segues nicely into your journey as a chef. I mean, I'm sure you've been through various different periods where you've had informed opinions as a result of being in close contact with food and developing you know, ways to get people to engage in healthy -er eating. But, you know, this, this paleo concept is very much something that you've taken by the teeth. Um, what was the trigger that made the confirmation in your belief that paleo is kind of king in terms of a diet or nutritional concept? Sure, sure, sure. Um, it was over 20 years ago that I uh, became a vegan for four years and, um, uh, I did that because I, at the time I thought it was the right thing, not only for my health, but also for the planet's health and also for the for the animals. And um, uh, after after a few years, I realised that it wasn't giving me the health that I desired um, or, I, or I, I deserved. Um, so then I became a little bit, um, I guess, 
disheartened with the whole health movement because I thought, wow, I, I was doing everything by the book. I was making my own kombucha 20 years ago. I was meditating every day. I was being a raw food uh, vegan. And um, so I was sort of, uh, I lost a little bit of faith in, in, in the movement. And it wasn't until my partner, Nicola, uh, was reading Nora Gagaudis' book called Primal Body, Primal Mind. Uh, she said, you know what, Pete, you should give this a go and have a read of this. And as soon as I started reading Nora's words, they just resonated with me. I was like, wow, this actually takes a, a step further. And maybe this is, maybe this is the answer um, to a lot of, a lot of my health issues. And I adopted them. And with, within a month or two, I just was a different person, uh, not only mentally, but physically and, and in my appearance and how, how my brain worked. <laughs> I was like, wow. I wasn't that sick, but let's investigate this a little bit further. And, and I started to do, do – I'm like a dog with a bone, you know. It's very hard to get it. Before I, I came out publicly, if you want to call, call it <laughs> And I looked for holes in it. I looked for as many holes as I could find, like because I knew that having a public profile, if I publicly went out there and said I'm paleo, and um, that a 20-year career in food might um, uh, it might backfire on me. So, but after I couldn't find any holes in it, that it actually worked for basically everybody that had done it. Um, I thought this needs to get out there to a larger audience and it's nothing I created it's you know, all the information has been done by by my mentors and uh, wonderful people over the last few decades um, I've just got a, a, a very I guess nice position to be able to spread it further than um, further because of where I sit at the moment Love it. Um, th you made a really interesting point about coming from veganism, which a huge amount of people see as a healthy uh, choice to lead your way of life. Um, what What do you feel now, like reflecting on it, was the shortcomings of veganism compared to what you now adopt, which you describe as paleo? Uh, uh, well, a lot of people can thrive on a, on a plant-based diet, and I'm not discrediting crediting that at all um, uh, for, a, for a period of time uh, it's a very cleansing way of life and uh, for anyone that's got um, a lot of toxicity in them if they've had a horrible diet for a few decades then you know adopting a plant-based diet might not be the worst thing you can do for yourself for, for short-term gains to, to cleanse yourself um, the issue I found was after I did go through the cleanse it, it, it wasn't strengthening for me uh, long term, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I find that uh, vegans, vegetarians, paleo all believe ninety percent or ninety five percent in the same same truths, which is we want a better planet, we want better health for everybody on the planet, we want the animals to live a better life, and um, we we can agree on those things. So a lot of people that come to paleo have been a vegetarian or vegan in in um, but they haven't found the health that they've been looking for. Um, so the shortcomings, as you said, um, obviously the fat intake is is definitely, I mean, the most obvious, um, most obvious thing that I, I think is lacking because, um, I mean, the current research is how much fat we should be having in our diet and um, unless you're eating copious amounts of avocados and potentially coconuts you, and nuts, um, you're not going to fulfil your fat intake. Plus the vitamin B12 that we do get from um, animal source ingredients. And I mean, I, I look at the work of Western A. Price, and I mean, we we look at indigenous and traditional societies uh, that have existed. <laughs> over the last three billion years, and we've always been hunter-gatherers. I mean, we haven't just been gatherers. We've always had hunting in, in basically every tribe or every indigenous culture around the world, and, and that should point to something to say, well, that's how we've got to where we are. Is it, a, it is a part of our nature. It's a part of our species. It's a part of, it's a part of everything, and, and uh, I think we need to embrace 
uh, the whole nose to tail concept and, and getting in touch with how indigenous tribes would not waste anything and how they would focus more on the most nutrient parts of a kill when, when they had it. And I think that's something that we, we definitely can learn from, from indigenous tribes around the world, the respect for, for the animal and respect for our part in harmony with nature. Oh, totally. I couldn't agree anymore. And I think if we look at all the things that most healthcare practitioners and promoters of good health are doing, whether we agree with their kind of concrete nutritional beliefs, whether that's veganism, paleo, primal, government food, pyramid, whatever, at the underlying principle is that we're all chasing optimal health. And if we can all agree on that, then I think the messages between practitioners can be less controversial and somewhere people can start to find a middle ground to say, okay, I see the benefits of this thought process. I see the benefits of that thought process and I need to find out where I sit in the middle. Maybe I need a high protein diet. Maybe I need a low protein diet, whether I need a high fat high. And it's, it's about empowering people with the knowledge to experiment with their own health and nutrition to find out ultimately what works best for them. Surely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and uh, you know, there shouldn't be any any arguments or any fights or anything like that. Or um, at the end of the day, we we all want optimum health for ourselves and our families, and and for our fellow human beings, and and for the animals, and for every inhabitant of, on the planet. So, um, uh, I, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there, and, and we're coming at it from from different angles. But I, I, I do feel there's a huge movement happening, and it's uh, it's an exciting time to be around. And it's um, I just can't wait to see where we're going to be in another ten to twenty years. Because if the movement keeps growing, then we're going to we're going to see a, a dramatic shift in the health issues of the Western world, that's for sure. And then hopefully we can deal with some of the larger issues I mean, um, about poverty and starvation and water and, and these types of things. Um, I, I definitely think there's an awakening happening consciously, globally, and um, it's, it's, it's time for change. Oh, definitely. My um, first podcast of this year was a podcast where I reached out to the listeners and I said to people, I said, look, what do you want me to talk about? What do we want to discuss? And I did a, just a one-on-one -on -one microphone session with my listeners. And um, one of the great questions was someone asked, Ben, what do you predict for 2015 in terms of the industry and how do you see your role playing um, a part in that? And I sort of started to elaborate that, you know, just what you said in that I start to see a shift happening, like this kind of paleo movement's been picking up steam for a good like four, four or five years now. And people are starting to see the value in real food, but also they're starting to see around the dogma or the media headlines or the pills and stuff. And I think if we can keep back in the drum and all these good nutrition and cookbooks and stuff can keep coming out. I, I genuinely think we can start to make a shift on obesity, lifestyle diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think it, I, I, for me, it, it's, it's a larger picture than that. I mean, it, for me, the first and foremost is, is individual health and especially children's health. Um, but for me, the long-term picture is, is how do industrialised countries or Western countries grow their food what will they be growing in the, in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, I mean, I live in a country at the moment that it's, its economy is based on food products that we do not need in our diet. Um, and now that is a scary proposition for a government to, <laughs> to potentially have to deal with. Um, but that is the reality. I mean, Australia is, is one of the largest uh, growers of, of sugarcane. It's the uh, largest growers of wheat. It's the largest growers of um, uh, dairy, I mean, or farmers of dairy cattle. I mean, it's, it's, it ba our economy it goes on that. I mean, even grain-fed meat industry. I mean, it's, that's why there is a little bit of backlash out there because there is a lot of money. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, if people are starting to get healthy and they don't need their medication every week, I mean, people start losing money. And for me, there's a, there's a bigger picture here at play, um, a, a, a much larger picture. And, and 
I was just finished filming my first TV series called The Paleo Way, and, and no one came to us and said, we'd like you to make a TV series on paleo. It was just myself and my fiancé just said, this needs to be out in the world. So we went and, and filmed it and put up the money ourselves, and we made a, I think we made a really nice eight-part series, and we start filming the second part, actually, um, a second series next week. Well, this week I'm filming with Dr. Natasha McBride in, in the United Kingdom, which is why I'm here. And um, we just want this out there. And, and for me, I just I, I see this type of TV as, as the first of its kind and, and for it to open the door for other people to go, you know what, we need to do more of these types of shows about food as medicine. Um, and we're filming a documentary at the same time for release for 2016, which is called Food as Medicine at the moment. Um, which which charts people's progress as they adopt a, a paleo or primal dancing or low carb high fat uh, diet or pro- dietary approach or autoimmune uh, protocol approach to treating their diseases and illnesses, and I think that will help again open the door for other people to start doing more of these types of TV shows and documentaries and movies and. Uh, You've got to put it out there to start with for other people to be able to go, you know what, that's what we should be doing. Because there's a lot of crap out there on television at the moment. Isn't it? Oh, God, <laughs> you're telling me. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's something that I'm... I'm I'm obviously a bit behind you on the whole the kind of TV thing, but it's something that me and someone else are now trying to do. Um, luckily, the un- other individual has quite a well-established um, media presence in the UK, but we're now starting to put together... Um, TV pilots that could be presented to the media are based around these subjects about getting this kind of information out there. So, you know, if I can join you and other people can join in, we, we start to we start to bang a larger drum. For sure, because I mean, someone might watch my show and they might go, yeah, "It doesn't really make sense," but then they watch your show and they go, "Hmm, something clicks." And it's usually, I mean, our first series is just aired in, in Australia and. The, social media response that I got was a lot of women were saying I, I got to watch it with my kids and then the kids were saying I want to eat that I want to eat that or they, they were saying that their husbands that they've never been able to get uh, to even consider a paleo lifestyle sat down and watched the show and they and they got that aha moment they went okay now I get it because it was presented in a different way mm. instead of um, potentially through Facebook or Instagram or through blogs or through podcasts or something. Everybody learns differently. So whether it's visual or whether it's through audio or whether it's through feeling it or, or tasting it, uh, there has to be all these different mediums out there for someone to be able to hook onto. And, um, and then hopefully what's presented makes sense to them. Amazing. Uh, oof, can't agree more. Um, you mentioned childhood obesity that's obviously a big talking point it's been uh, thrown around in the uk media quite a lot over the last three months you know the government have been talking about strategies and plans and everyone's been shocked by the statistics um i think it's a subject that runs sort of deep into your values and both mine um and i've brought this up on the podcast a few times and the big problem with the topic at the moment is there's a huge a lot amount of taboo around it because you know a lot of the time you're po- you feel like you're pointing the finger. Like People get very defensive and reactionary when it comes to childhood nutrition. It's like you're accusing them of um, not treating their child the right way. But you know, ultimately, the, the, the food that goes on the child's plate is quite often the responsibility of the parent that's bringing up that child. So you know, sometimes we do have to kind of look at that. Um, what are your views on the answer to the problem? Like, How have you been tackling the the issue of what our kids are eating? That's a really good question, uh, childhood obesity. I mean, whenever I think about paleo and the message that we're trying to push out to anybody that wants to listen is about that it's not about weight loss. It's about reclaiming your health, first and foremost. I mean, weight loss is, is, a, is a bonus, or if you're malnourished or an underweight, then generally you will uh, put on healthy muscle and, and, and healthy weight. Um, uh, but children, um, if you think about you're an adult, 
you go through your life, you get to make a choice every day about what you eat. I mean, the only people that don't really get to choose what they eat are usually the very old that are being looked after or the very young, um, being children or babies. Now, it is in every adult's or parent's, it's every parent's responsibility to make sure that they feed their children the most nutrient-dense food. Now, it doesn't matter if their friends down the road are feeding their kids the worst possible food that's available on the planet. But that doesn't mean you should either because, you know, it, it's interesting. I've been called an alarmist or an extremist because I advocate eating chemical-free food or try to find organic or try to get grass-fed meat or find wild, sustainable seafood to put on your dinner plate. Um, and... I, I don't mind if, I, if I'm called that because I, I think it's extreme to feed children poison. And current research says that the sugar-laden pr products and with vegetable oils or with refined flours and stuff are, are causing major, major problems. So is it, I call it poison. Now, why would anybody do that to their children? Is it... Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But um, but apparently we're the minority and uh, the majority is still doing it. So hopefully in the future when more and more information comes to light, uh, truthful information, then more and more people start to potentially listen to their, their intuition and... Um, make wise choices and, and have conscious choices about the the impact that food does have on, on the next generation because, unfortunately, addictions form from a very young age and, as we can see now with the obesity epidemic, uh, addictions are very hard to, to kick for a lot of people because they've been eating these, these types of addictive foods ever since they were young. Some people, it could have been 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Some, it could have been 60 years of eating um, uh, foods that, that cause inflammation and cause addiction. So it's, it's difficult. I mean, if you think about an alcoholic or a drug addict, they might have only been using for 10 or 20 years, whereas some people have been using food as, as a drug for a, a lot longer. So it is hard for people to give this stuff up. So I don't have the answers, but I do know that it all comes down to a choice. And, I, and what I say in my seminars when I speak to people is if you do have an addiction, then there are people out there that can help you overcome that, uh, whether they're therapists, there's different types of therapists out there, whether they're hypnotherapists or whether they're psychotherapists or whether they're kinesiologists or um, potentially spiritual healers or energetic healers, if, if, if that's what you need. Everybody is different and everyone will find the answer to overcoming their, their potential either negative patterns or their addictions. But there's nothing wrong with seeking help for them. I actually think it's empowering or it's, it's, it's a show of strength for someone to admit that they've got a, an issue and they need help with it. I mean, if your, your car's broken, you take it to a mechanic. If your teeth are busted you, or in pain, you go to a dentist. But if you can't stop eating those donuts at three o'clock in the afternoon or the bar of chocolate in your bed at night time, then, and you know that that's an issue for you, then, then seek help. One thing uh, I've been called in the past is idealistic, you know, when we're talking about the same kind of issues, childhood nutrition and stuff. And without being idealistic, you can't really have an imposing view and you need to kind of almost have an opposing view to start to be heard and start to make some kind of impression. If we had a just a slightly different view to anyone else, it might not really ever get noticed and you never really pull people up to the place that you want them to be now if you're quite idealistic and you're shooting for the optimal if you pull people up halfway close to where you are that's actually quite a lot of progress a lot of the time to where people are right now oh for sure and, and i think you just hit the nail on the head is optimal health i mean in my country and i know other western countries around the world we have uh, dietary guidelines in place now the guidelines the question I have to ask is why are the guidelines not created for optimal health? Why do they not show the 
the best possible uh, diet or, or ingredients possible for optimal human health. <laughs> answer me that. I mean, no one can answer me that. Is that. They say that, oh, we need to take into account everybody on the planet and everyone's socioeconomic um, situation. And I'm like, well, yes, but should you not present the optimal or the optimum of what being healthy should be? And then it's up for everybody else to, 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 to either strive for that or at least to be aware that, okay, that's what we should be eating. I mean, at the moment in, in my country, um, we have the Healthy Eating Guide. It's very similar to the American food plate, but it's, it's a little bit more uh, illustrated. And the largest piece of our plate or our healthy eating chart, uh, it, the guidelines say we should be eating the most out of everything of refined carbohydrates. Now, we know we have an issue with refined carbohydrate consumption in the Western world. So why are our nation's dietary guidelines advising us and encouraging us to be eating, getting most of our calories from this so-called food group? I mean, it, it does not make any sense to me or anyone that's educated. It doesn't make any sense to. So, I mean, I'll tell you what, theories and kind of opinions have been battered around on this topic for quite some time. Do you still think there is potential issue with big farmers influence on how the recommendations are still being dealt out oh, a, a, a thousand percent for sure uh, as i said before i said our, our, uh, especially in our country in, in america it's um the uh, agribusiness i mean it's set up for that the whole system is is set up for exactly what's on that chart or those guidelines and that's why, that's why I guess one of my goals is, is a little bit larger than just individual health. It's how, I mean, let, let me put it to you this way. We've just started a 10 week program uh, where people adopt a paleo way of life. And, and I've worked on this for two years so that people that are interested in reclaiming their health, they can get guided along for 10 weeks with the science. The, the information, the science behind it as to why, uh, recipes, how to implement that, that are family friendly, budget friendly, achievable, and uh, not, not too hard. Um, we've got f fitness in there as well, because that's an important part. And we've also got mind body connection and um, talking about the power of decisions and, and the power of ego and the power of uh, negative belief systems, how to turn them into positive ones. Uh, I've also got a naturopath on board. Now, my, the whole goal behind putting this program together is to create a community of like-minded people that adopt it. Um, because once that community starts growing, they will start to influence their own communities. They'll, they'll start with their own families first and foremost, which is the most important for, for everybody. Uh, and then once that starts to happen and, and people start to wake up, then they'll start to influence the, ch the PNCs, like the Parents and um, Citizens Association, uh, Parents and Children Association of Schools, they'll be able to influence daycare centres or kindergartens. They'll also be able to start influencing hospitals, aged care centres. They'll also start being able to influence with their with their dollar, which is the most important thing for so many people, is what they spend their monies on. So then the supermarkets or the markets or, or the convenience stores will start to stock the products that these people want. Now, this might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, it could take 30 years. I, I have a feeling things are going to change very rapidly within the next five to 10 years. I think we're going to see a major shift. And that's... That's what this is about. It's about creating the... Because it's not going to come from the top down. We're not going to see a change in our healthy eating guide or the, the American food plate or whatever, uh, the British Dietetic Association, whatever they stand for um, and what they endorse as the healthy eating chart for, for the UK. It's not going to come from the top down because it can't, because their hands are tied. The government's hands are tied through big agribusiness. The Dietitians Association or the Dietetics Association, their hands are tied through their 
commercial ties with with multinational food corporations. I mean, for instance, in Australia, you go to the, our governing uh, health authority is the Dietitians Association of Australia. Uh, they want me arrested uh, and locked up for, for spreading information. Oh, they've, they've taken out press releases and saying I'm dangerous. <laughs> now, now, they have. They've seriously said that Pete Evans and the Paleo Way is dangerous, and they've released press releases that have gone out to our major newspapers. Um, now, their hands are tied, and, and, and this is the issue because they go to their conferences, and guess who they're sponsored by? They've got Coca-Cola as a sponsor, or Unilever that it makes, um, or Nestle. There, there's a lot of people that are in binds, so to speak, and I don't think it's a conspiracy as such, but I do think that a lot of people are a bit stuck. So the only way these, these things are going to change is from a grassroots movement of more and more people just changing it themselves. Well, I think uh, these days there's a lot of people doing it, so I think uh, I think you're right. Five, ten years, I think we're going to start to see some real solid movement, and uh, I'm excited that you know myself can be sort of a part of that. I think it's really, uh, really, really fun um, and really kind of uh, empowering, and it means you're kind of you're, you're making a, a dent with your work now. Coming back to a point you made about kind of the dietitians and the food pyramid and stuff, I saw recently um, sort of some social media activity around dietitians um, and you, you kind of almost sparked a bit of a war between sort of opinions. Is Was that as a result of your kind of frustration with the advice they're giving out, the advice you're giving out and basically that clash and obviously it, I take it some of these press releases was almost a bit of an outgrowth of that? Yeah, uh, it was interesting. I did a tour about six months ago around Australia with Nora Gagadis, who wrote Primal Body, Primal Mind. and She's a bit of a mentor to me and many others out in the paleosphere. And what I wanted to do was actually bring her to Australia and then stand up and do a four-hour talk about the science of paleo. Um, so we did that and we had sold out, sold out rooms where we had thousand people in pretty much every state that we visited and we did it all in a week and, and a week later um, the Dietitians Association issued that press statement that said don't go the paleo way and we called out to the paleo way I, I called the name the paleo way because I because I, I, it's a way of life and and uh, I never I guess poked the bear so to speak I, I wasn't about I never came out publicly to, to denounce the work that they were doing. But uh, I tell you what, if, 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 if someone releases a press release into um, the media and then every newspaper in the country reports that and says, and they came back out and they said it's a dangerous way of life because it's too expensive apparently from their, from their studies, which showed a hot, stupid study, and it's, um, and it's too hard. Now, you tell me we're too hard and too expensive, and neither of them are uh, definitions of what paleo is anyway for anyone that adopted it because it's super simple and it's super, uh, super affordable. Where do they get dangerous from? So I had a choice to make. Do I just let that happen and let the public get their information, their false information through the media, or do I actually go, you know what, uh, they're actually telling lies, and let's present a different side of this. And I, I've been able to use social media to, to, I guess, illustrate that it isn't hard and that it isn't expensive and that it isn't dangerous. In fact, uh, we have close to three quarters of a million people now on Facebook um, that follow sh my page, Chef Pete Evans. And uh, even last week, I asked people to share their success stories. We had 2,300 success stories of people that have managed to deal with Crohn's disease, irritable, irritable bowel, uh, chronic facetic syndrome, um, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, obesity, of course, is one of them, uh, anxiety, depression, behavioural disorder in children. Uh, cancer was brought up by a couple of people saying that they've had remarkable results. Now, I'm not saying that this way of life cures anything. 
Okay, all I'm saying is, or what other people are saying is that it has helped them manage these conditions better than they ever thought possible. Now, if this is happening to people that have had, had chronic illness for some, some of them 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they've managed to, I guess, get on top of their, their illness by changing their diet and eliminating a couple of so-called food groups, could you imagine what that could do, not only to a population, but to people that are already thinking that they're healthy? I mean, this is where it gets exciting because if you could, if you could amp up everyone's energy levels and, and, and get them uh, working to, and, and operating at 100%, I mean, think about the workforce. Think about how many sick days aren't going to happen. Think about the productivity that's going to happen. Think about the, but apart from working, think about the interaction that people are going to have with their families, with their loved ones, the energy they're going to have to cook dinner and provide for their families. I mean, I'm getting a little bit passionate now because I see a, a, a big picture here that, that I see this way of life as the first step in, in waking up. Um, or getting out of that sort of brain fog. Because once that happens, then people start to think, they start to put their dreams and, and, and goals into play. You know? and, and that's where the magic starts to happen. I've got a group of people that are going through my 10-week program at the moment. We took 15 people to, to do it first just to get rid, find it, fine-tune any bugs in there, technical glitches. And we're halfway through with this beta test and we had, um, I just asked them for their experience. Where are they at halfway through? And um, some of the women have um, children with behavioural issues and they said that after three weeks they've had such a turnaround. Um, I had another lady that just said that she works with um, uh, children with behavioural uh, issues at the moment and, and learning difficulties and she, she now goes my dream is to get this information out to the to the broader broader thing and, and start an education program for all of the schools that deal with this using food as medicine and here's someone that couldn't she said that she couldn't even f think about face getting through a whole day uh, less than five or six weeks ago she was. She struggled to get out of bed in the morning, and within five weeks, she's she's already dealt with her own problems or issues, and she's now thinking about how she can influence her community and in a broader scale. Now that is what excites me. That's what this is about. Could you imagine when you've got millions and millions and millions of people all thinking about how they can help other people, and not just, oh God, how am I going to get through today? Amazing. Um, this has been a, a big theme throughout the podcast that we've talked about and the fact that, you know, in the fitness industry, in the kind of health space, the focus is very much on kind of uh, the vein side of health. So body composition, weight loss, that kind of thing. And, you know, it, there's a thread here that we're talking about that, you know, the focus of everything that we do should be optimal health. You know, we should be chasing that optimal health and you hit the nail on the head like once you get energy from your food and your lifestyle like everything else falls into place it's a it's a bigger picture than just eating food that has an effect you know your energy feels good you feel good about exercise you feel good in your home life you had a good you have a good sex life like all these things have massive interplay and a lot of the time it does come down to the foundation of your diet it, it does and then uh, Going back to what I said, it's, it's, it's one of the first ways to wake up. And as soon as you wake up, you, you become hungry for more. You become hungry for more information. You become hungry to help other people. You become, you become uh, hungry f to see what's possible because you start setting goals for yourself. You start setting um, you know, crazy things. You start to see the big picture. And you're like, okay, well, potentially there's a, there's a possibility that I could do this or we can do this. And um, that's why I'm excited. I mean, going back to earlier in the conversation, I mean, we this is worth, and I won't say fighting for because I don't like it's a negative word fighting for, but it's worth standing up for. It's worth um, putting your head out a little bit and 
fed up. I, I, I cop a few punches here and there on, <laughs> in the media because I'm seen as a bit of a, a laughing stock because I am a celebrity, so to speak, in my own country. Uh, not many people know me outside of my own country, but when you are in the media and you stand for something that is considered a little bit left of centre, and I don't think this will be seen left of centre in five years' time. I think the standard Australian or the standard UK or the standard American diet, that'll seem extreme. I think extreme is when people are taking pharmaceutical drugs daily. I think extreme is when people are injecting themselves. Uh, that, to me, is extreme. I think eating healthy is is is, is normal. And um, I, I believe that we're going to get there. And I believe we're going to get there faster than anyone's thought. I know it's amazing what's considered normal these days. I just, uh, I just drop my head. I don't often engage in the argument because you kind of almost lose the will because m- most people aren't willing to listen. Obviously, you you kind of pick your battles wisely and who you can kind of help. Um, right, I know you've only got five minutes left to speak to me, so I wanna I wanna wrap up two things. We've we've talked about this word paleo, and paleo gets a a huge amount of positive response and negative response, and I think. Mm-hmm. Some of the negative response from people, especially in educated communities, is possibly its its extreme stance that is produced or sorry per, perpetuated by some individuals. Like this is totally off the menu. That's totally off the menu. This is evil. In your way of thinking about things, what does paleo mean to you, and how do you explain it to other people? Oh, that's evil. I, I love that. That's so funny. Um... Oh, well, I just had the best lunch in one of your most magnificent restaurants here at the UK. It was called Lyle's. And yesterday I went to St. John um, and I had the best paleo food ever. But was it listed as paleo on the menu? No. Did they know that it was paleo? No. It was just good, honest food. I mean, I had an amazing pig, so I had amazing seafood. I had amazing vegetables. I had amazing salad. I had a cup of tea on the side with uh, peppermint leaves and spearmint leaves. What is paleo? I mean, paleo, of course, does get bashed around a bit because every article that you'll see, you'll usually see a caveman and a slab of steak or, or meat. And it's because that the people that are writing this are uneducated about what paleo is. I mean, if, if we can get the right information about what paleo is, and I, and I think we're going to struggle because it's it's been taken the wrong way ever since it was sort of put out there. Uh, I think the caveman diet was, um, and I don't never call it the caveman diet, and whether we call it paleo or banty or low-carb, high-fat or primal or ketogenic, they all pretty much mean the same thing. It's, it's about the removal of or elimination or reducing the amount of inflammatory foods in it into our diet and the foods that don't serve us as well as other ones. I mean, I don't think there's anything evil about some of the foods. <laughs> you know, I don't have nightmares about them. But we can just make wiser choices most of the time when we're out or when we're cooking food or at the supermarket or the grocery store about what we should be feeding ourselves and our family. You know, we're not. It's not going to be 100 percent all the time that we can eat to our own ideologies. But I believe that 95 or 99 percent of the time we can make the wisest choices possible at that particular time. Um, so paleo, for me, in a nutshell, is eating the most nutrient dense foods that we have evolved to eat, and through the science behind it. And and for me, it's. Um, uh, like everybody else that talks about paleo, it's about eating good quality fats first and foremost from whether you get them from fruits like avocados or olives, coconuts, uh, potentially nuts, and, and of course animal fats from land or sea animals that have had a natural diet. Um, it's about eating a small amount or moderate amount of, of animal protein from land or sea animals again that have had a, had a natural diet. It's not quantities or large quantities of, of meat. It couldn't be further from the truth. Um, it's, it's about moderation of your protein. And then it's an abundance of beautiful, fibrous, above-ground vegetables predominantly, if you can, if they're seasonal. 
Um, you know, you're not going to die from eating sweet potatoes. <laughs> just, you know. But if you want to lose weight, then you should probably not overdo the starchy vegetables. Or, I mean, it, it just makes sense. You shouldn't overdo eating probably too many starchy fruits because they, they'll, they'll, they'll mess with your hormones and your insulin but, and your blood sugars. But, you know, just just make wild, wise choices and listen to your body. Um, personally, I, I try to avoid grains at, at, because I don't think they're the most nutrient-dense food on the planet for us. Um, if I had a beak, maybe I'd, I'd go there a bit more, but I don't. Um, I don't choose to eat dairy because it just doesn't make sense to me um, uh, and it doesn't work for my body. I know a lot of people in the, in the paleo and low-fat low world uh, love dairy, but um, if, you, if you can tolerate it and you are completely fine with the ethical nature of how, you get, how we get milk from a cow... And I'm not talking about milking it, but I'm talking about a, a cow has to give birth for it to produce milk. Now, if we take away some of that milk from that cow, uh, then either the baby cow's not going to be able to access that, so what are they getting fed? Um, but we all know the reality is that if you're a male, uh, if you're born a male cow, you generally uh, veal within five days or six days' time, and and the trip to the abattoir is usually not uh, one that's conducive to animal welfare. Um, then the other side of that is, is the whole impregnation of the cows to keep them reproducing each and every year. Um, and for me, I just think it's, a, it's, it's quite a... Uh, one thing that I think we could all agree on, as we touched on before, animal welfare, and I think dairy is the most horrendous um, industry on the face of the planet when it comes to animal welfare for so many reasons. And it is for a product that none of us need to have in our life for optimal health. I mean, it's, it's proven that we do not need it. Sure, we can survive and some people actually thrive on fermented dairy if it's from raw cow's milk. But can we not thrive through other means as well? without having to go through that whole uh, process of, 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 of that industry. Um, and, and, of course, we, we steer clear of refined sugars as much as we can, uh, which gets harder and harder each, each and every day. But if you can read the labels and, um, and make wise choices, then I think you're ahead of the game. I think uh, that was a, a very nice, simplistic summary. Um, I think... You know, the, the simplicity of your answer was eat whole natural foods where possible. Obviously, you've developed, um, you know, different thought processes around different foods and whether that's based on research or personal experience. You, for me, you're conveying that in the right way. And it's a it's a process of experimentation for people that they need to go on themselves, which, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with. Um, right, I know it's uh, time for you to leave, Pete. It's the last question. Um, I know you're in the UK. You're a big chef. The big question on my lips is, have you met Jamie Oliver yet or are you going to? <laughs> oh, pucker. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely jubbly. Um, I met Jamie about 10 years ago when he came to Australia on one of his naked chef tours or something, and uh, I was lucky enough to have three minutes with him before his uh, publicist moved him on to the next person who had three minutes with him. Uh. Um, no, but I have a, I have a, uh, I would love to spend more time with him. Um, unfortunately, he's uh, publicly denounced paleo in on his website. Working with a nutritionist, they said that they don't agree uh, stop, um, taking our food groups from, from your diet. So I'm not sure how that is going to work out, but I have to say I have the utmost respect for, for the man and, and what, he, what he does and continues to do because, uh, going back to the start of our conversation, he was someone that was willing to put his neck out mm. for something that he believed in. Um, and he's worked with the disadvantaged, he's worked with your school systems, he's worked with uh, American school systems. He's always uh, seems to me a, a fellow that wants to leave the world a better place than he found it, and, and he's found his life's purpose. And um, he's definitely inspired me on so many different levels. Um, and, I, and to be perfectly honest, I think he's actually uh, put open the door 
for this next stage of um, what we're talking about now. Um, and, and I have to thank thank him for, for everything that he has done because uh, how do I view this? Jamie's talent has gotten has gotten people back into the kitchens to cook real food. Um, and now the next stage is where I see myself and other contemporaries coming through is to now let's educate people about what food actually is all about, which is medicine, apart from just um, replacing junk food. Let's now actually get into the specifics of it. Let's work out how we can use this as a tool to reclaim our health. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. God, I um, I was I was just letting oh. you roll, buddy. I was letting you roll. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, no, my Jamie, my, my headphone headphone speakers just went off. My my noise cancelling went off just then. It was like beep. Oh. Um, I'll pick up that. So, um, yeah. So I, I I've got full respect for uh, Jamie and um. I, I'm looking forward, and I, I'd love for him to jump on paleo. Because imagine if Jamie took paleo, where the world would go quicker than what we'd be doing it ourselves. Um, but one can only wish. Um, and I, I, I just want to add something too. When we were talking about diet before, is um, the importance of healing our guts. And I think fermented foods is is something that's not really promoted a lot in when we talk about paleo. Um, I know it is becoming more and more prevalent and, and more spoken about, but it's sometimes it's overlooked. And I think um, for anyone that does adopt this way of life, really research um, Dr. Natasha McBride's work on um, fermented, fermented vegetables and even Sally Fallon from Nourishing Traditions. Uh, these two people, and even um, Donna Gates, who wrote The Body Ecology Diet, um, is, research this because... I mean, my daily diet uh, includes fermented vegetables at every meal or some sort of fermented drink or something. Um, very, very important, and uh, I don't think it should be overlooked because I, I believe this is where paleo is going to go probably in the next five to ten years. We will focus more on uh, energetic food sources. So instead of uh, the consumption of docile animals, I think we will be eating more, a lot more wild uh, animals. We'll be we eating more... Um, local foraged um, native foods. Uh, I dare say Australian native food is going to be uh, quite prevalent within the next 10 years because it is some of the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet. Um, and I dare say we're going to see a lot more ferment, ferment, fermented foods, not only vegetables, but I, I dare say if, uh, animal proteins as well um, because that's how, we, how it used to be and it, it, it it's going to come full circle again, I think. Well, I'm for all four foods that have got a great and nutritional content, that's for sure. Um, Pete, uh, thank you very much for joining me on my show. You've given up an hour of your time. That's uh, very kind. I know you're hugely busy on tour in the UK. Um, your new book is out. That's why you're over in the UK. Um, tell people yeah, where, where they can get it, what, what the crack is. Sure, I think I've got a couple coming out this year here. I think the first one's Paleo Every Day, um, and the second one is The Paleo Chef. Now, these books uh, do contain sweet options and dessert options, and I'm not saying to eat these things every day, and then I think there's a couple of dishes that have got quinoa in there, so for everyone that's um, in the paleo world that doesn't eat these, don't attack me for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, these books are sort of nearly like transitional books for people. Um, but for anybody that wants to know more, jump onto our website, www.thepaleoway.com. Um, join up for our 10 week course. You can do it from anywhere in the world. We've got a lot of UK people already joined up, and um, uh, I think you'll enjoy the ride. It's going to change people's lives. It's, it's a bit of a game changer. So, Ben, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful talking to you, and I hope everyone um, got a little bit out of this talk. I, I, I certainly did, so thank you. Well, I think people will get a lot out of this, and we'll make sure we uh, spread this talk far and wide so people can... Uh... Uh, can experience it and learn from it and hopefully spread that message on again you know uh, 
we, you and me spread messages and we, we talk about stuff all the time on social media, but it only gets out there if people share it. And that's the key thing. So if you're listening to this show, you found it valuable, look, share it with a friend, share it on Facebook, put it out on Twitter, wh- whatever your medium is, please help people just try and make, even if it's one change or a big change, um, it's really, really important. So Pete, again, thank you very much. Um, Pleasure, brother, and um, keep cooking with love and laughter. I will. Uh, and everyone listening to this show, um, sorry about any earlier sound issues. Pete is on the road, so um, it's understandable. He's flying around on a Skype on mobile, um, so apologies for that. Um, me and Rachel will be back on next week's show for uh, the usual Q&A, uh, and then a guest after that. So that's ciao for me, and Pete, ciao from you. See you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Speak to you soon. Bye. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 120, here in big figures these days. Um, I am joined by the beautiful and far more elegant than myself, uh, Rachel Guy. Rachel Guy, how you doing? 